Hi, welcome to the Bridge Podcasts. We hope you enjoy the following message. For more information on all that's happening at the Bridge Church, please visit www.bridge-church.com. I've been sharing on uh, divine healing and uh, the, the power of God, and we've seen it manifest uh, just last week with uh, uh, the, the baby that we've been praying for, uh, a total turnaround. The baby was born six weeks early, lungs not developed, on a respirator. Uh, we prayed last Sunday morning and last Sunday afternoon. He came off the respirator, is that right? Um, and now he's in a cot. Uh, you know, when we pray, things happen. We're expecting the supernatural to happen every time we pray. So we've had supernatural signs, wonders, and miracles. How many of you know that you've had a a supernatural sign, a wonder happen in your life over the last couple of months? Please stand. Those that know that they've had a, a, some, it's been a miracle, some it's been a sign and a wonder, but these, these are people that has something miraculous happened in their life over the last few weeks. Uh, So uh, when I just see them, I think of God's greatness. Amen. Thank you. You can be seated. I think, and and you see, now uh, what I'm going to share on today is we know about the supernatural power of God, and we know that when he releases something into your life, according to Mark chapter 4, the enemy comes immediately to steal that seed back out of the ground. Well, today I'm going to show you eight ways that you can hold on uh, and to live your best life. And all of this, what we're doing right now is we're, 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 we're doing a book or a booklet. It won't be a full book. Uh, it's getting bigger all the time, though. Uh, so we're, we've got a, a, a booklet and healing coming out, healing for every sickness known to man. And we've got scriptures that go along with it. So uh, if you've got schizophrenia or whatever, or eczema or whatever, uh, there's scriptures there to pray for, pray for everything. No matter what it is, if it's scurvy, if it's athlete's food, it doesn't matter what it is, it's in there. You can pray, there's work, there are scriptures there for everything. And then behind that, we're going to have uh, how to keep your healing once, you, once you've got it, and things to do not to get sick in the first place. Amen. And that's what we're going to talk about today, because God wants His people healthy. Do you know, God wants His people well. He took the whole of chapter 11 in Leviticus to say to His people, don't eat these things. There was no McDonald's there, or else McDonald's would have been on that, or Burger King, or KFC. If you you work for any of them, please, it's just fine. Keep working there. Uh, It's like, it's it's not the fact that McDonald's, Burger King, or Kentucky Fried Chicken are bad. It's bad if you have too much. Do you know what I'm saying? It's the, it's the amount by which, to which you're eaten. So, eight ways to live your best life. We have a responsibility to live our best life and to live it as a blessing to others. We are responsible to live our best life and be a blessing to others. <laughs> Amen. We have a responsibility towards our wife, our children, if we're married. If, not, if we're not married, we have a responsibility toward our parents, our siblings, uh, to future generation, to fulfill God's plan and fulfill, uh, for our life and to fulfill our purpose. So no matter where you are in the scope of things, whether you're married or unmarried, you're responsible for your life, okay? You are responsible for your life. You're responsible for the successes, and you're responsible for the failures. Uh, And if I had time to go into that, and I'll touch on some of it this morning, but I've got a lot to touch on, so as we go through this, uh, you've got to know that we have a purpose for being on earth. We're not here by accident. 
God put us on an earth and this planet for a purpose, and that was to uh, let pe- to worship Him, for He seeks those who will worship Him in spirit and in truth, and He wants you to be well as you worship Him. Let Let me just read this from Romans 14. Uh, and it says, for none of us lives to himself. Your life, in some way, affects someone else. You're not here as a bump in a log. Your life, in some way, affects somebody. So for you to say, I'm worthless, I'm a nobody, nobody loves me, nobody cares for me, that's not the truth. That is a lie of the enemy that he's planted a seed in your mind uh, that that is bringing you to a place where you have no self-respect or no honor for yourself and no future for yourself. You're, you're, You're falling into the enemy's trap. So we're all, none of us here are here to live, especially when we have children. As soon as we have children, your whole situation changes again, and your life is for your children and the generations that will come after you. So your life then is changed to being an example for your children and your children's children, because I do, or I did, my mom's sitting there, and uh, my mum is 80-something. 80, 80 uh, <laughs> forgive mum. And uh, anyway, my dad passed on uh, some time ago. But my dad did what his dad did. And his dad did what his dad did. Yeah. Are you with me? And they were brought up in Ireland, and this is the way they lived in Ireland. So even when, when, when my dad came over here and he met my mom, he was still doing the things he was doing in Ireland. And the way his dad brought him up was the way he was bringing us up. The way he punished us was the way his dad punished him. The way he lived his life was the way he had the example from his dad. So we don't live for ourselves, and, and it's the same with you, you, you young girls and everything, you know, it's like uh, uh, when we got married, you know, it was like, this is the way my mum used to do it. That got me into some trouble. <laughs> uh, my mum used to cook, ve- she used to do it, and it was like, here's the dinner and the flying saucer. Uh, a paint scraper to scrape the dinner off the wall. Uh, You see, that could never have happened. Uh Uh-huh. Yes. Anyway, uh, that's it. You know, uh, we're going to bake, uh, you know, you're going to bake a cake and and we're going to break something and you do it in this small tin. Why are you doing it in that small tin when you could do it in a big tin? That's the way my mom did it. Uh, You see, so a lot of our life is learned uh, process that we learn from those that have gone, gone before us. So uh, none of us lives to himself, and no one dies to himself. You see, uh, uh, that's why suicide is so horrendous, and that's why uh, taking your life uh, through uh, debauchery, for example, is, is so wrong, because you, you, you then affect your whole family, uh, you affect everybody that's around you, and it's just such a devastating thing in people's lives. Uh, are you with me? So uh, we, we don't die to our, uh, really uh, die to ourselves. although in Christ we got to die to ourselves to live for him. For if we live, the Bible says, we live to the Lord, and if we die, we die to the Lord. Therefore, whether we live or die, we are the Lord's. So we've got to get this in our hearts. We are the Lord's. Amen. And uh, he's the one that raises up. He's the one that puts down. He's the one that uh, eventually says that it's appointed every man wants to die. When your appointment comes, that's when you're going to be with the Lord. But up until that time, we have his word, Psalm 91. Uh, he gives his angels charge over us to keep us in all his way, uh, that no evil shall befall us, neither shall any plague come near our dwelling. You know, there's things that we can declare that will make sure that we live uh, our lives till our appointment. But nobody misses the appointment. So if my appointment was at 10 minutes past 12 on the 10th of June, 
uh, you could start counting down right now if you knew when it was because in two minutes' time, I'm going to be lying right there. Uh, but that's it. No one would miss the appointment. You know. But God gives us scriptures for our protection while we do live and for our family's protection. Have you got it? So, why does he do this? Because God gives life to us all, to every living creature. There is no one born by accident. Nudge your neighbor and say, you know you're not an accident. Do you mind if I take my jacket off? We're, oh, need prayer. Uh, there's no one born by accident. This is what is, the word says in Psalm 139. Your eyes saw my substance being yet unformed. Before I, this is Jeremiah 1.5 from the message, before I shaped you in the womb, I knew all about you. Before you saw the light of day, I had holy plans for you, a prophet to the nations. That's what I had in mind for you. You know, this brings me to a situation where we just got to know that everything, once a seed of life has been sown into someone, that seed of life, becomes a, a, a spirit. It's, 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 it's a God-given life, okay? From the, from the time that seed is propagated in a womb, it's a life. God has a plan for it. God has called it before it's even born. That's why it, uh, abortion is so heinous. It is so wrong. Child murder is so wrong. Are you hearing me? It is so wrong. It's God doesn't want, because God had a plan for that child. Listen to, listen to this story. James Robinson uh, from Life Today came into the world as the product of a forced sexual encounter. His mother was raped. And his mother tried to have an abortion, but the doctor then in 1943 would not comply with her wishes. So when he was born, she put an ad in the newspaper, uh, baby for adoption or something to that effect, uh, unwanted baby, come and adopt him. Anyway, a ministry couple uh, called the Hales came and adopted him. His life had many twists and turns, but at the age of 16, his, well, before that, his, uh, his mother that gave him up came back and got him and, and lived uh, with a guy that was an abuser and everything else. But at 16, he was so fed up with that, uh, nearly shot, uh, he was going to shoot his, um, this guy that was in his mother's life. He had so much, he went back to the Hales that had adopted him. And uh, when he got there, they were having a revival meeting. He gave his life to Jesus at 16 years old. And then at 18, he started ministering the gospel as a young evangelist. And uh, between then and, and in his early 20s, he had started doing evangelistic meetings where more than 20 million people had come to his evangelistic meetings. And more than 2 million people at that time had made decisions for Christ through his ministry. If the doctor had said, I'll do the, I'll do the abortion, there'd have been 20 million people that hadn't been, and that was only up till then. Now, his ministry, uh, Jesus Alive Ministry, is, is uh, James Robinson's ministry, although uh, Peter and Anne Pretorius uh, are, are, are doing it in Africa, but he's feeding nearly a million children per day in schools. He started a process which will never end. If the doctor had aborted him, if it was uh, uh, 2000, uh, the year 2000 on, uh, where abortions are just so easy, we would never have had someone like that feeding a million children a day. Hello? Before that you were born, you were appointed for something great. Are you with me? Glory to God. Glory to God. We've got to realize that, and I'll speak more about this at the men's meeting where I can get down where it all happening. Uh, you know what I'm saying? I'm, I'm going to get down and we'll 
deal with the subjects really at the point of uh, at need for the want of saying something else. But now he's, he's drilling water holes all over Africa. He's, he's working in the Sudan. He's doing farming projects uh, all over the world. People are coming to faith in Christ. And at 70 years old now, he's fit and he's healthy. And he's still got a future and a hope. Amen. I mean, are you getting this? God wants you to live the be- your best life. And the best life you've got is the one that's according to his plan for your life. So find out the plan. (laughs) Follow the plan. How many of you think that would be a good idea? Don't resist the plans of God. Listen to your pastor speaking. I'm speaking from the Spirit of God, the words of God that will change your life. It may may challenge your life, but if you accept the challenge, it will change your life. So, eight factors to living your best life. Number one, exercise. (laughs) Get up at four o'clock in the morning and run across the moors. Hey! I don't think so. There's there's some some things that you might not want to do. But, uh, you see, the Word of God says this in 1 Timothy 4, 8, and this is the Message Bible. I really like that. You've been raised on the message of faith and have followed sound teaching. Now pass on this counsel to the followers of Jesus there. And you'll be a good servant of Jesus. Stay clear of silly stories that get dressed up as religion. Say amen to that. Exercise daily in God. No spiritual flabbiness. Please. Workouts in the gymnasium are useful, but a disciplined life in God is far more so, making you fit both today and forever. You can count on this. Take it to heart. Paul says in 1 Corinthians 9, 27, but I discipline my body and bring it into subjection. You see, your body needs some discipline. There, uh, uh, you know, you can, you can go, unless you're an Olympic athlete, unless you've got a plan, uh, you, and God's given you, you, you see, you can be Olympian, you can be whatever, and you can use your, your, your athleticism for the God to, to bring others to Christ. Uh, so that's the purpose of, of whatever we do, but we got to discipline our body. If I didn't discipline my, there's, there's mornings I get up and I don't feel like going walking. There's the, I just don't feel like doing any exercise. Have any of you ever been like that? But if that is every day, you've got to say, there is something wrong here. I need to do something. Because you need that. You see, your body is the temple of the Holy Ghost. That needs to have some strength. I'm going to have a busy summer and a busy autumn, but I, I need that strength. I've got that strength, and I'm going to push through to do everything I've got to do. And uh, no matter if I'm uh, at this stage in my life or wherever, I'll still do everything I need to do, and I'll do it well because I've disciplined my body and brought it to a place where it can carry me to d- carry the spirit to do what's necessary. Uh, are you hearing me? So that's one thing that we need that's very important for our life exercise. And that doesn't matter what age you are. Until recently, my mum would be on a treadmill down in, uh, in Cowen and Sports Ground. She'd be uh, in her 80s working out uh, in, uh, more than once a week. Uh, I went into my mum's house uh, just a couple of years ago, and I was shocked. It's a shock. I saw a wee fit under the TV, and I said, <laughs> what's that? She says, it's my wee fit. I said, what do, you, what do you do with it? She's looking at me like I'm glaikit. She said, I keep fit. In her 80s, buying a wee fit. Are, are, are you with me? You still, she, just go back to it. Uh, I don't, <laughs> now, she, she's working through some health issues right now, and we believe God for total healing in Jesus' name. Amen. But... Uh, she's got that mindset to, to, to keep fit. Uh, are you with me? 
Number two, food. Uh, and how many of you want me to move on from this straight away? <laughs> I'm not going to. In the book of Leviticus, God gave his people directions on how to eat and stay healthy and live holy as he is holy. Food can make a big difference in your life. Uh, uh, you know, eating the wrong things at lunchtime can push up your glycemic index so by one o'clock in the afternoon or two o'clock you feel like going to sleep because you've eaten the wrong things at lunchtime. So you've got to understand that if you don't eat the right food, you're going to be uh, uh, unproductive. So you've got to have the right food, you've got to have it in the right amounts and that sort of thing. Uh, in Acts 27:34, it says, Wherefore, I pray to you, take some meat, for this is for your health. Uh, the rest of that scripture, I don't know if I could go to that, but since not a hair will fall from the head of any of you. I should have got a hold of that scripture uh, years ago, <laughs> but anyway, I didn't. But uh, you eat for your health. Are you with me? You eat for your health. You know that uh, uh, there, there are some maladies that uh, people have, and it's called anorexia. I think sometimes I'm anorexic because when I go to the mirror and look, I see a fat guy looking back at me. You know what I'm saying? <laughs> <laughs> That's a joke. <laughs> so, but anorexia is the opposite way. People don't eat. And that's bad for their health as well, you know, and it's like uh, fasting. You've got to be fasting with wisdom. If you're fasting, you've got to fast with wisdom so that you stay healthy. Being healthy is the, the result God wants for you. Uh, Philippians 3.19, the Bible says, whose end is destruction, whose God is their belly, and whose glory is in their shame, who set their mind on earthly things. You see, if God is your belly and you can't say no to something, uh, whatever it is, it can be all sorts of things. Uh, there was a guy came to church here for, for a long time, and he was a big guy, and I, and I saw him one day, and he was, he was on his fourth, his, he drinks two two-liter bottles of Iron Brew a day. Uh, when he was on his second one, I says to him, why do you drink that stuff? He says, oh, I like the taste. I says, man, that stuff will kill you. So he stopped drinking it and lost two stones within six months. Do you know what I'm saying? You know, it's, it's just, you can't take all that stuff into your body and, and expect to live, uh, live well. So uh, the, the the, you, uh, you fall victim to your taste buds. Uh, and you've got a thing in your brain called the apostat. And unless you can get control of your apostat, which controls your appetite, then uh, the, 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 there's no limits. Amen. <laughs> someone's, is, is someone smile and say, we still love you, Pastor. <laughs> Listen, I'm not looking at anybody. Okay. I don't think I am anyway. Uh, number three, temperance. When you sit down to eat with a ruler, consider, we have to be temperate in life. When you sit down to eat with a ruler, consider carefully what is before you and put a knife to your throat if you're a man given to appetite or a woman. Do not desire his delicacies for they are deceptive food. You see, in a lot of delicacies, there's no nutritional value. It's deceptive food. You're just eating because of your apostat, the taste, the love, the taste. So you eat it, but it's not doing you any good. Uh, and you've got to rationalize what is doing you good and what. <laughs> Lord, give me the grace to finish this message. <laughs> uh, grace and mercy on anyone and everything and anybody here. I'm not speaking to anybody, okay? I'm teaching you the word. For their deceptive food, uh, the Bible says this in 1 Corinthians 10, and everyone who completes for the prize is temperate in all things. Now they do it to obtain a perishable crown, but we for an imperishable crown. So God is saying we have to be temperate in all things that we do. In everything that we do, 
We should be temperate. So even in our exercise, if we're not exercising for a purpose, uh, then we should be temperate in our exercise. Exercise enough to, to give you a good feeling. Uh, uh, you know, when, when I was a boy, not so long ago, uh, one of the things that, we, that, that, that I did was worked in a farm from when I was very young. My mum's there, she can tell you. And uh, we all had to go out and we were digging drains and ditches and doing all sorts of things. But when I was young, when I was like 13 years old, I could put a pitchfork in a hay bale and I could lift that hay bale above my head and put it on a, a, tra a trailer so that it could go into the barn. Now, hay bale's heavy, but I'd built up my core muscles so much and it's the core of everything that we need to know. Once we have a core, a sound core, we'll live and be strong for life. Yeah. Amen. So you, we've got to work in our core, not only our core physique, but our core beliefs. Yeah. Amen. Spiritually as well as physically, we've got to work on our core. So your core becomes really strong, and that will carry you through uh, many things in life. Uh, it, it's like for this half of the body to co cooperate with this half, the core has to be strong. Uh, so uh, we we got to get to that place where temperate in all things, and when you've got that, then you can go on. Uh, and then the Word says in 1 Corinthians 10, therefore whether you eat or drink or whatever you do, do all to the glory of God. So whatever you do, do all to the glory of God. Someone said, Pastor, this would be a good time to talk about alcohol and drugs and other abuses that you put your body through. Now, I'm going to say one thing. I'm saying, if you, if you are, use alcohol, okay, make sure it never, say never, becomes a stumbling block to another Christian or to a new Christian or to anyone. Amen? If you use alcohol, do it to the glory of God. Now, how would that glorify God? Well, you could use it, maybe have a couple of glasses of something just to relax you or something like that. But So, we've never preached against anything. What, I preach, what I'll preach against is if you're doing something that's not glorifying God and it's bringing this church or the body of Christ into disrepute and people say, well, isn't that person a Christian? Doesn't he go to that church? Look at him. That's bringing the body of Christ into disrepute and God's not getting the glory. Are you hearing what I'm saying? And no matter what we do, God is to get the glory. Yeah. Are you hearing me? So I'm not preaching against anything. But I'm telling you, whatever you do, whether it's in eating, whether it's uh, in drinking, let all that you do, and no matter what it is, driving, Facebook, social media sites, don't go on there flapping your gums at people and judging them. Whatever you do, do to the glory of God. Bill... <laughs> Good preaching, Pastor. Keep it up. We're loving this. Go! <laughs> oh, man. Sometimes, as a pastor, it's no easy. You, gotta... you see, I'm your father in the Spirit. And, and, and some things, sometimes as a daddy, you've just got to say, you're killing yourself. I heard the story this week of a wee girl, 13 years old, I think she was, lying in the middle of a field, so drunk, her friends all left her, called the police or the ambulance, whatever it was. She was starting to drown in her own vomit, and a guy found her in the field and pulled her to the side of the field, and... Uh, I, I personally know a young man that was with other young men that I know that watched as a friend died on this, 
right in front of them. They were all so drunk, they didn't know what to do, and he died in his vomit. Choked to death, drowned in his own vomit. Did that glorify God? You know, that's years ago now. His family are still grieving. His family's still grieving over his death. Are you hearing me? We, a quaffo works in the A and E. The biggest, his biggest clientele is drug abusers and alcohol abusers. And all the hospitals and the whole NHS system, I read about this recently. Everything that people are visiting the NHS with is mainly caused by abuse, overeating, overdrinking, drugs. Something like that is, is what is costing the NHS so much money. People trying to abuse, because they don't have a good self-image about themselves, and they don't know if they, uh, uh, that they're bringing disgrace on themselves and on their family. I'm oh, moving ahead. Okay. Oh, I don't know if this is a good one either, but number four is obedience. <laughs> uh, our sister Deirdre just shared on that. My son, uh, this is from Proverbs 4.20, give attention to my words, incline your ear to my sayings, don't let them depart from your eyes, keep them in the midst of your heart for their life to those that find them, health to all their flesh, keep your heart with all diligence for out of it springs the issues of life, put away from you a deceitful mouth and put perverse lips far from you. You want to keep your health you got to have deceitfulness, perverse lips far from you. you got to keep your heart, for from out of it flows the issues of life. I will never say I'm sick. It doesn't matter if I've got symptoms. I'll say I've got symptoms. And by the stripes of Jesus, I have been healed. So that's what I'll say, but I'll never say anything else. Amen? Amen. So that's what we got to get to that place where we understand that uh, uh, psychoneuroimmunology. Uh, May uh, Smith sent me a thing from Portugal yesterday, and it says this. <clears throat> it says, um, oh, it hasn't come through. But anyway, it was, from, it was something she read in a, a newspaper in Portugal, and she says, scientists have now concluded that whatever we say affects our health. Negatively and positively. So that, that's what we got to know. So, uh, number five, cheerfulness. A merry heart makes a cheerful countenance, but by sorrow of the heart, the spirit is broken. Scientists also tell us if we laugh, it massages the heart. So you say, well, how do you do that? Where you go? Ha, 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 ha
But even although that something attaches itself, you can still live cheerful. You can still live hope-filled. You can still have a future. You can still focus on something. Uh, and uh, uh, to prove that, there, there, there's a guy that's going about, uh, I can't pronounce his surname, Wojcik, uh, and, uh, Wojcik. And he, he's only got a, a, a little thing he calls a chicken leg, and he's got no arms, no legs. He was born that way, perfectly formed, but just nothing else. And he's winning hundreds of thousands of people to the Lord because he's looking at what happened to him so positively that he's winning people to Christ. He's just been married. Uh, he's going all over the world, uh, ministering powerfully. Uh, so you can live in, uh, uh, happy, cheerful, in no matter what situation you are, but it's not God's will if you can do something about it and God's word prescribes uh, a cure, then you really need to uh, walk in his will. Number seven, the thought life. For as he thinks in his heart, so is he. Proverbs 23, seven. Eat and drink, he says to you, but his heart is not with you. So Proverbs 20, our thought life has to be in that place where you realize, I want to live my best life. I want to do my best for my children. I want to do my best for my family. And that keeps you established in that place. So uh, once we anticipate that a specific outcome will occur, our subsequent thoughts and behaviors will actually help to bring that outcome to fruition. You've heard me talk about that plenty of times. That's your... A uh, reticular activator, you have a goal, you have a vision, then your brain is focused on that and it will bring those things to bear in your life. That helped you, I know that. And number eight, uh, I was going to have seven and then I was uh, walking on the beach this morning and I thought, no, no, I have to put this in. Rest, number eight. Rest in the Lord and wait patiently for him, the Bible says in Psalm 37, 7. Don't fret because of him who prospers in his way, because of the man who brings wicked schemes to pass. Cease from anger, forsake wrath. Don't fret, it only causes harm. You see, anger, bitterness, wrath causes you to be sick. It will cause sickness in your body because you'll get screwed up from the neck up and you won't be able to handle those things and your thought life starts to get, your mind, your brain starts sending off negative endorphins to the places in your body. You start having arthritis problems, rheumatic problems, and all these kind of problems because you haven't forgiven. You've got wrathful thoughts. You, uh, you, you, you're just mad at the world. You're going to live sick if you're mad at the world. So, evil do it, the Bible says, for evildoers shall be cut off, but those who wait on the Lord, they shall inherit the earth for yet a little while, and the wicked shall be no more. Indeed, you will look carefully for his place, but it shall be no more. But the meek shall inherit the earth and shall delight themselves in the abundance of peace. Let me tell you something about rest. Rest is something that you can have in the middle of a storm. Rest is something that you can have when everybody around you is totally confused. Rest is something you can have in a panic situation because you have control of your inner man. You can say, peace be. I sit there before, before I come up here on a Sunday and I just say, Holy Spirit, just fill me with your peace. And I rest in the Holy Spirit. If I've got a decision to make, I just close my eyes and rest in the Holy Spirit. You can work 90 hours a week and still be totally rested because you're taking a quiet time, you're taking a time out, you're taking time to rest. When everybody else is going, you heart around you, you're resting in that uh, fact that God is refreshing you when you take that moment of refreshing. And listen to what the Bible says in Isaiah 28. For with stammering lips, 
speaking in other tongues, this is talking about. And another tongue, he will speak to this people to whom he said, this is the rest with which you may cause the weary to rest. And this is the refreshing. This is the refreshing. So when, when, when things around you look... Uh, 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 Jude 20 says, praying in the Holy Ghost builds us up in our most holy faith. For with stammering lips, God will bring you a refreshing. He'll bring you rest. So when you're in a troubled situation, you're stressed, that everything seems to be going, you and your wife are having intense fellowship uh, or whatever, just pray in, the, pray in another tongue. Pray in the Spirit. And you will get to that place of rest. If your boss is coming at you, go to the toilet or tell him you're going for a smoke break. Even if you don't smoke, you're allowed smoke breaks. So go to the, go where, don't go where they go, but go wherever so you can get a rest and, and you can pray in the Spirit. And the Bible says, come to, in Matthew 11, come to me all who labor and are heavy laden, I will give you the rest. Take my yoke upon you and Take my yoke upon you and learn from me, for I am gentle and lowly in heart, and you will find rest for your souls, for my yoke is easy and my burden is light. So we've got to get to that place in Christ where we cast all our burdens in him. Therefore, my, Acts 2.26, my heart rejoiced, my tongue was glad, moreover my flesh will also rest in hope, for you will not leave my soul in hell. So you don't need to worry about dying and going to hell. You can rest in the fact you're going to heaven if you're a Christian. And the Bible says, nor will you allow your Holy One to see corruption. <clears throat> you have made known to me the ways of life. You will make me full of joy in your presence. Guys, everything God does is according to his pattern based on his principles. Once you learn the principles of God, once you learn the principles of life, once you understand that these principles, if acted upon, will bring you to a place of rest, to bring you to a place of divine health, will bring you to a place of good success, what you've been believing for, but we've got to follow the rules. We've got to follow the principles of God's Word. Are you with me? So this will be in a book, and now, just quickly, and I'm not going to give you any, uh, anything else other than the, the headlines there's destructive factors that will bring sickness on your body. Number one, immorality, 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 fornication, fornication. That means having sex before you're married. That means having multiple partners. That means uh, you can end up with STDs. That means you can end up not having your dreams fulfilled. That means you, you can have such disease you won't have children because you've messed yourself up. Same for the men. Uh, they're, they're, and, and some STD clinics, you've got to make a two-month appointment because things are going off the chart. STDs, for your information, is sexually transmitted diseases. Dr. Sarah can give you Dr. Dermot, Dr. Aquaffle, the doctors that's in this place can tell you the dangers of that. It's dangerous. It will have an effect in your life, not only in your physical being, but in your brain. Because once you connect with someone intimately, you've already hooked up with them in your mind. And that's a problem as well. So immorality can bring great problems in your life. I want to tell you this. God's a God of grace and mercy. Mercy is the, the harvest that we should have reaped, we won't reap because of God's mercy. So you can pray for God's mercy in your life so that you can be, if you've done something, if you've been involved in abortion, if you've been involved in, in, in multiple partners, if you've been involved in any of these things in fornication, ask God for his mercy but don't just ask them, cry out for mercy. Cry out and shout, the Bible says, for mercy. And, and uh, 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 reading a story about Guruk in 1858, uh, when there was revival in the streets, people were lying in the street crying out, Lord, 
Pour your mercy out in me. I'm a, I'm a worthless sinner. Pour your mercy out in my life. They didn't know what else to say. They just said, give me your mercy. That's what we need to cry for, mercy. Somebody say, mercy. Mercy, mercy Lord. Mercy, Lord. I, I'm not preaching to anybody. I'm just telling you the facts. Okay, these are things that will stop you living your best life. These are things that will be like running into a brick wall that will stop you dead in your tracks and, and you'll be so um, mentally ill-adjusted you'll have trouble getting to see things through the, the right focus. So these will be in that book. Wickedness. Wickedness is another thing. Uh, you see, we can be wicked in our actions and the Bible says that God will bring those wicked people to the pit of destruction. So we've got to walk uh, in, in righteousness and true holiness before God. And, and number three is disease. Um, Satan will bring disease into your life. But Jesus said to the, to the, the woman that was caught, uh, with an issue of blood or, or bent over, be loose from this bond on the Sabbath. God anointed Jesus of Nazareth with the power to set people free who had been bound up by Satan. All of this comes from the devil, and we got to know that. And injury is another thing that uh, will bring us to that place. And, and Jesus talks about uh, these are destructive things, a certain man who went down from Jerusalem to, Jerusalem to Jericho fell amongst thieves, stripped of his clothing. Uh, things can happen to you in your life, but that doesn't need... My, my, my cousin was, a, was attacked and mugged one night years and years ago. It must be 25 years or 20 years ago. Uh, he never went outside the house again. He, he, he's, he's just, he just lives as a hermit now. You see, that injury shouldn't have stopped him uh, living his best life. Okay, it wasn't good, but it shouldn't stop you. You know what I'm saying? That you, you, we need to get over things and move on in life. And then the last thing is debauchery. For everyone that doesn't know what debauchery means, it's immoral self-indulgence. It's, it's like binge drinking, going on a bender, blowout, burning the candle at both ends, carousal, depravity, dissipation, drunkenness, fast living, fornication, gluttony, and, uh, intemperance, lasciviousness, lechery, lewdness, licentiousness, life in the fast lane, overindulgence, seduction, seduction, and sensuality. That's all from the English Dictionary. That's what debauchery is. Nudge your neighbor and say, I'm glad you're not one of those. <clears throat> God wants you to live healed and whole, and he wants you to live your best life. How many of you know that? Thanks for listening. Remember to visit our website, www.bridge-church.com, and connect with us via Facebook and Twitter.